I mean, I think, you know, we don't, I, I never realized um, how important food is until I did an MDRS crew a rotation this January. Uh, and, you know, you, you think about the close proximity of living with people uh, in this uh, confined space and uh, some of the arguments or the issues that you might have or you, if, if the stresses that you go under. And the hugest point of contention that we had within our, our group, our crew, was who was going to get the, the chocolate chip cookies or the cookies with the M&Ms in it. Uh, so food was probably one of the biggest issues that we had. You know, it wasn't about showers. It wasn't, it wasn't about downtime, and it wasn't about, you know, Internet. It was about food. So I'm really happy to have um, Dr. Jean Hunter with us today. Uh, she's an associate professor bi at Biological and in Environmental Engineering Department at Cornell University, and her work focuses on food systems for planetary exploration. And she co-leads a food study at our very own Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. Please welcome Dr. Hunter. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think you may have already heard the, uh, the joke about the restaurant on Mars. The food is wonderful, but the atmosphere is not so hot. <laughs> so uh, today I have a lot of material to present. I'll try to stay on schedule um, for, 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 for Keith's sake. Um, but uh, I have, uh, I'll talk first about why food systems are important to a uh, long-term mission. Uh, I'll introduce some of NASA's uh, current prepackaged space foods. And as you can see, I have uh, quite a few examples here to pass around. And actually, I'd like to get a volunteer from each half of the audience to, uh, to come and uh, get your stack and start uh, handing it around. Could you help me in? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, let's wait for just a little while, okay? Then uh, prepackaged food is not the only way to go to Mars. So there are two other food systems that I'll describe. The bioregenerative life support system where you grow your crops, then process them into ingredients, and only then turn them into table food and eat them. And then cooking from bulk packaged ingredients, which is the way Shackleton and Scott and Amundsen and the old polar explorers did it. And I'll end up with a description of some of our new work, the study at MDRS, and a very new project that's just about to launch at uh, the Bed Rest Center at UTMB, uh, University of Texas Medical Branch. It's NASA's uh, microgravity analog uh, bed rest center. So wherever people go, whenever people go on long missions, they have specialized food to, uh, to take them there. And uh, where is my pointer? <laughs> is On the upper left is, um, is, is Shackleton's um, ship. Uh, and on that ship, they had a skilled cook preparing the food from shelf-stable bulk packaged ingredients. Um, going down uh, counterclockwise from there, there's ISS. <clears throat> and here the, the mission is uh, fed by individually packaged shelf-stable foods, some of them freeze-dried, some of them in other forms. <clears throat> On the lower right is the Antarctic station. And there, again, a skilled, cook, uh, still a skilled cooking staff prepares the food. But here they have access not only to uh, shelf-stable foods, but also frozen foods. And there's a small greenhouse that, that provides small amounts, very small amounts, a couple of lettuce leaves a day, of uh, green things during the long Antarctic winter. And finally, uh, that's a taro field at the top right. If you go to colonize, you need to bring not only food, but you need to bring the means to make your food sustainable. And just as the... Um, the ancient Polynesians did, we will have to bring our crops and establish them uh, wherever we go if we're going to have humanity there for a long time. So why, why do we even look at food? Um, we, we've heard a lot about planetary exploration, the, the kind of science that we could do on Mars. We've talked about the different ways we could get to Mars. We've talked about what our living quarters could look like on Mars. Why worry about the food? Well, 
food is essential to the crew's health and to their physical performance. It's also essential psychologically. Uh, Jack Stuster, uh, who is a specialist in isolated and confined environments and who's been consulting and writing about this topic for 40 years, calls food the quintessential habitability issue and uh, says that food is uh, expected to carry a disproportionate burden of psychological support. Well, uh, if you think about that, that makes a lot of sense. In a, uh, imagine yourself on Mars in a small habitat where the four walls, or maybe the one circular wall, never changes, where the view rarely changes, where you can't go outside and take a walk, uh, where your company is the same every day, uh, where your schedule is the same every day, and when you're under stress from uh, either the demands of your work and of um, maintaining your environment or under the gun from the folks back home who are expecting you to get a lot of work done that you maybe don't quite have time for, then food represents a source of comfort. It, support, it, it represents a source of variety in your life. It is a link to, to back home to Earth and to your experiences with food from your childhood and your past. All the good things that you remember about food uh, can be evoked by what's on your plate tonight at dinner time. So food is very important, but food is also important in mission planning because food systems are extremely expensive. The transportation costs to low Earth orbit is, uh, well, depending on who's talking, it's somewhere between um, maybe $50, at the very, very lowest um, estimate, up to $10,000 a pound into LEO. Um, and to Mars, it's going to be even more expensive. Food requires the expenditure of resources during the mission. Even prepackaged food requires water to rehydrate, and waste management facilities. And cooking also requires a good deal of crew labor. So those combine to make food very expensive, which means that the food system for any mission has to be thoroughly planned in advance. So what does the food system need to do? First of all, it needs to have the proper nutrition. And it turns out that uh, except for a few minor features, nutritional requirements for space are pretty much like what they are on Earth. A balance of carbohydrates, protein, fat, and fiber. Now the nutritionists will tell you a certain amount of fiber and the astronauts on microgravity missions will tell you they desire a much lower amount of fiber. The reason is that elimination is so very difficult in space that they prefer to do it as rarely as possible. So th they tend to select very low fiber dishes. Uh, the calcium requirements are fairly high because we want to make sure the calcium uh, in the diet is enough to support bone regeneration. However, megadoses are not a good idea because they'll just pass through the, the astronaut and clog up the urine reprocessing system. Okay. Um, energy requirements are actually about the same as on Earth the energy that you don't spend fighting gravity to stay up is spent um, staying in one place while your body is trying to float away. There are specific limits on iron uh, in microgravity missions because during the first few days of a mission, an astronaut will lose about a liter of um, plasma volume. And that means that the red blood cells become very concentrated and the body then breaks them down over time, slowly, about 1% a day um, for about the first two, two weeks, until uh, the hematocrit, the fraction of red blood cells in the blood, is back to the normal levels. And that iron is stored. Now, uh, most, most Westerners, particularly males, have high iron stores already and excessively high iron stores um, have bad cardiovascular effects. And so rather than having the astronauts donate blood a week before their mission, uh, NASA uh, requires that the diet be limited in iron so that, uh, so that the iron overload isn't exacerbated by the diet. 
Sodium is another bad actor. Uh, sodium makes food taste good, but again, there are cardiovascular consequences. There are also consequences for the water treatment system. So um, the goal is something like 3,500 milligrams per crew member per day. That's recently been dropped to 1,500 milligrams per crew member today, but it's all awash because none of the shuttle or ISS diets ever picked by a crew had less than 4,500 milligrams of sodium per day. The astronauts taste their food before they leave and they pick what they like and they're allowed to, to have what they like. Okay. The food has to be safe. Um, the, it has to be pathogen free and the bio burden, the amount of microorganisms per unit mass or unit volume has to be acceptably low. And of course, the food has to be tasty. Uh, the first thing you'll hear from a space nutritionist is that uh, if somebody doesn't eat the food, that food is by definition not nourishing. So the food has to be good enough to be eaten. It has to be highly acceptable and palatable when fresh it has to retain that palatability after storage. It has to provide variety in the diet because um, a steady diet of the same things brings on what we call menu fatigue and a drop in intake. It has to include choice. Uh, there has to be um, an element of choice by the astronaut in what he or she eats because that, that um, promotes higher intake. And there has to be an element of novelty, too, because the rest of the, um, habitat, the habitat and the mission can tend to be boring in, in very various ways. Uh, the idea is to achieve a degree of familiarity, variety, and novelty without boredom. And this is actually quite a difficult um, requirement. Um, in addition, those prepackaged foods have to be easy to use they have to be compatible with the exigencies of preparation and use in microgravity. And they also have to be, um, they have to be compatible with a closed life support system. That is, uh, the pickled garlic that you might like um, may not wish, your crewmates not, may not wish you to be eating that on orbit. So here's ISS, and what is it like to eat dinner on ISS? Well, uh, these, these foods are uh, foods from earlier space missions. On the table, on the bottom below the tray, are foods from the original Apollo missions. You can see on the right-hand side uh, food cubes, which are compressed and covered with gelatin so that they can be popped in the mouth and be hydrated in the mouth. Not real tasty. Okay? In the middle, I don't know quite what that is. I think it's freeze-dried rice and then maybe some freeze-dried meatloaf. And the, um, the long package over on the right is a drink bag. And I'll pass around a few of those um, in a few minutes because that concept is still um, applied in, um, in, in the current food system. On the tray are the foods eaten in Skylab. Now, Skylab was unique among uh, NASA missions in that they had frozen food as well as uh, freeze-dried and canned and natural form food. So, uh, so you can see various dishes here. I believe on the left is some sort of spinach. On the right is, a, that looks like a ham slice to me, maybe some lasagna. Um, and in the back, that, that bulgy container there is a, uh, is a drink container. And right in the middle below that, you can see a little can with something in it because they use canned foods as well as these other um, processing types. And most, most interesting here, compared to the Apollo foods that you see on the bottom, which needed to be eaten with the fingers or with a spork, uh, the, the Skylab tray has a fork on the left and a knife and spoon on the right so that you can eat like a typical Westerner. You can have a dining experience instead of just a refueling experience. Now here are some, some foods that are uh, used on the current shuttle and ISS. This is where I'd like my volunteers to come up and uh, take the samples for passing around. Now, I'm going to need these things back, folks.
make a couple trips. Okay. So what we have here is a collection of foods that, uh, that might very well be eaten on the space shuttle or ISS. Food comes in a number of different forms. There is retort-pouched, thermally processed food. Uh, if you've eat, ever eaten those Indian entrees off the shelf from your grocery store, that's what that is. Um, and you can see that in the bottom left, um, that uh, beef steak, and there's, a, there's one of those going around, is, uh, is actually uh, is full moisture food that's been thermally processed. They also use irradiation, but uh, less than they used to. Then there is um, freeze-dried food, and you can see um, the beef patty on the left and the cream spinach at the center top there, which are rehydrated uh, according to the directions on the package through a little uh, valve that's punctured. Hot water goes in, you kind of massage it around, and you wait a little while, massage it again, and um, maybe you let it cool if you like it cold, uh, maybe you put it in a food warmer if you like it extra hot, and then you consume it. There are intermediate moisture foods. Uh, those are foods which are not bone dry. They have some moisture in them, but not enough to, um, to spoil. And an example of that would be the dried fruit at the top left, or the cheddar cheese spread in, in the middle. And, and those of you who have ever had MREs may recognize that package. Okay. Then there's food in its natural form, stuff that's dry enough to, um, to survive without spoiling for a long time such as the cracker at the upper right and the candy-coated peanuts, the peanut M&Ms on the far left. And finally, there's a drink bag. Um, some of those are going around right now. And in those, uh, you, you hook those up to a, a fluid dispenser. You dispense either cold or hot water, depending on what you like. If you're on the Russian side, you dispense either warm or hot water, depending on which you prefer. Russians, uh, cult there's a cultural thing in Russia that you don't drink cold water. You drink at room temperature. So the Russians, if they're rehydrating their orange aid, they'd go for the, the, the barely warm water. Okay. So these, these are making the rounds. And like so much NASA technology, the uh, food processing technology of NASA has also been taken up and adopted in the, um, in, 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 uh, terrestrially. So I'm going to pass around some, uh, some freeze-dried fruit chips. And after the, after the talk, we can, we can actually break those open and sample them. Uh, we also have some, um, some backpacking foods here, which I need back because I'm taking those to MDRS for the food study. Okay. Now, the food is not just doled out to the astronauts uh, uh, according to the... the um, uh, command of the nutritionists. You know, they all sit down and they taste the food before they go to space and they decide what they like. So here we see um, uh, Chiaki Mukai, John Glenn, and Curtis Brown tasting their food. You can find all these pictures on the web. You can see Curtis has got the cracker, they've got the lemonade, um, and they're tasting various things from the, from the, from the meal. Once they go up, what they eat and how they eat is up to them. This is Ellison Onizuka from Hawaii eating the way he eats at home with his chopsticks. And you can see that uh, all of the, um, the, the packages are there on the, um, they're Velcroed to his knee there. Um, okay. And here is your story, Musgrave. One thing astronauts love to do in space is play with their food. And what story is playing with here are the candy-coated peanuts. Okay. And here's somebody else who's playing with their drink. Uh, he has in the hand, one hand, looks like he's wearing two watches, so I can't say the hand with the watch. He's holding a drink bag, and he has squeezed out a blob of uh, fruit punch there, uh, which he's going to try to capture with his mouth before it gets into the filters of the equipment. There in the back, uh, there's another fellow eating a sandwich or something, and you can see that his food is really not falling off his lap. 
it's, again, it's, it's bungeed or Velcroed uh, to his lap. And uh, since it's in microgravity, it doesn't really matter uh, which direction he's pointing, the stuff won't float away. The food uh, in space is either uh, anything that is flowable, like, um, like, like drinks, is kept in a completely closed container. And anything that you take the top off is, is designed either to be crumbless or to be sticky so that uh, it'll stick together and particles won't float off into the cabin. So one of the biggest uh, um, tales, uh, the widest, uh, one of the most, one of the best known tales about astronaut food is that shrimp cocktail is the most favorite thing that they eat. And this is, this is definitely true. And you can tell by the recipe that NASA uh, takes great pains to make this excellent. They don't start with frozen shrimp, by golly. They start with the fresh shrimp. They devein it right there at JSC in a special way that re reduces the uh, bio burden, the amount of microorganisms in it. They uh, boil it with uh, salt solution for the texture. They boil it with seasonings to flavor it. They uh, freeze dry it. They add freeze dried cocktail sauce because you can't add that before you freeze dry it. Um, and, and and put the dried shrimp on top and apply vacuum and seal. The vacuum is important because any oxygen in the package will uh, over time oxidize the, the uh, lipids in the material and make it taste rancid. To use this, you'll add water, wait, massage the package, um, wait again, cut, up the, cut open the package, and, and then uh, consume. The amount of labor to do this is less than five, five minutes per package. So here are two other astronauts enjoying uh, what I think is dessert in space. Catherine Thornton has, a, has a, a bird's eye frozen strawberries which have been lyophilized and then reconstituted. She's also got a commercial yogurt or vanilla pudding. And Al Sacco uh, is a, is, is eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich uh, made on a Taco Bell shelf-stable tortilla. NASA does outsource a lot of their, uh, their foods. Okay. Now, why is it that astronauts eat tortillas instead of regular bread? No. Is it because Mexican food is so delicious? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, someone already shouted out the answer. It's crumbs, because tortillas don't crumble the way uh, ordinary bread does. When you eat a sandwich, there's always a few crumbs that are left on the plate. In space, they don't get left on the plate. They get left in the filters and the equipment. So tortillas were introduced by a Mexican astronaut. Uh, the, the dietitians decided they would, they would make something nice for him and make some Mexican food. And it worked so well that that's been the standard bread on board uh, the shuttle and ISS ever since. And we use them out at MDRS as well. Okay. Now, they don't only have those, um, those prepackaged foods to eat. There are small amounts of variety that can be brought in in other ways. Uh, during the first couple of days after a progress delivery, there, there might be fresh fruit. Though no bananas. Bananas really stink up the place. Uh, there, there is on ISS a lot of plant growth unit designed by uh, Utah State University. And here is one of the cosmonauts, um, um, his face reflected in the mirrored door of the uh, chamber, uh, looking at some mizuna, which is a, it's a leafy brassica. It's a kind of lettuce that's, uh, or leafy, leafy lettuce-y type plant that's popular in Japan. Okay. And uh, Sandra Magnus, uh, who had some spare time on her hands on ISS, has, has mastered the art of space cooking. Uh, she's showing on the left, um, Mexican scrambled eggs in a tortilla, and on the right, a black bean and corn dip. It's very laborious to cook in space. You have to put everything in plastic bags, and the only way to cook, to heat things up, is with the food warmer, which is kind of like a slow cooker. So she says the, the results are mediocre, and the process is laborious, yet she persists. That's how important variety in food is to the human, to the human being. So what are the issues of food in space? Why can't we just take these uh, foods that you've all examined and just pack our, um, 
our habitat full of them and send our astronauts off to Mars. Well, one problem is that the astronauts uh, who eat this food on the ground, pick the diets that they like, and then go into space, start complaining almost from when they get up there that food tastes different in space. It's bland. Uh, it doesn't taste right. Uh, they, they complain or they report that their food preferences change. Things that they didn't particularly like on the ground, but, um, but they put in their food locker just because the nutritionist highly recommended it, become their favorite items on orbit. And stuff that they loved on the ground is kind of meh when they get up there. Uh, so what is responsible for this? Nobody knows. We have some theories that I'll talk about later. Another problem is menu fatigue. After a few months of eating this kind of food, boredom sets in, um, intake falls, and for astronauts who come back after three or four months and then go up on a second mission, before they've experienced menu fatigue, uh, they'll experience it early on the second mission. A big problem is insufficient food intake. The astronauts are busy, they are under stress, they're experiencing menu fatigue, they don't feel like eating, they, their sleep cycle is off, and intake is a big problem because all of the, um, the degradation in the human in organism that takes place in microgravity happens much faster when a person is undernourished. Muscle, for example, if you aren't eating enough, your body will metabolize muscle for energy, and then you won't have the muscle strength that you did before. The other issue with the present life support, or the present space food system, is that it's not very compatible with a sustainable life support system. If you're going to grow plants or algae or something for, uh, to, to revitalize your air and purify your water, it may as well give you your food as well. Okay. So um, here we are on Mars in a Mars habitat with a little pressurized Mars rover here. What are we going to eat and how are we going to provide it? Well, it depends on how long we're going to stay. This is a graph, a kind of conceptual graph, of life support mission costs versus mission duration. We have to keep the cost of the mission down. So for any mission that we, that we pick, we need to pick the life support system that has the lowest cost for the mission that we choose. So in very short missions, like the Apollo mission, uh, everything was once through, as you can see on the left. The water, the air, um, the solids that were used, they were thrown away immediately after use. On the shuttle and on uh, the Apollo missions, uh, there was air regeneration, uh, well, not on the Apollo missions, but on the shuttle and on ISS there is uh, water regeneration. Humidity from the cabin is collected, purified, and returned to the potable water system. Uh, on longer missions, you can do oxygen re regeneration, not just stripping the CO2, but uh, actually regenerating the oxygen as using, for example, the Sabatier process that we heard about earlier uh, in the conference. And finally, uh, for very long duration missions, it, it makes most sense to just take the farm, um, a very high mass um, um, capital investment, and to take the food processing equipment and to grow your food and process it and eat it up there. So that's what we would want for a very large long-term colony or for uh, or long-term outpost or for an actual settlement. Here's what a bioregenerative life support system would look like. Uh, food goes to the crew uh, from food processing and preparation. The crew exhales CO2, which goes to the right to the plants. Uh, the crew takes in drinking water from the water management system and rejects it to the wastewater processing. Uh, wastewater processing gives um, cleaner water and fertilizer to the plants. Solid wastes go to solid waste management. Um, some of those solid wastes uh, can be taken up again in the wastewater. Some of them goes just to deadlock and storage. The plants that take up the CO2 in the wastewater produce water vapor, which goes back into the potable water system. They produce crops, which go into post-harvest processing. The um, inedible portion goes into solid waste management, and the edibles go into food processing and preparation. So we can see that this is not just farm to table directly. 
you don't go out to where they're growing the wheat and put your mouth over the end of a stalk of wheat and call that dinner. Um, now, some things can be eaten directly from the hydroponic garden. Here we have uh, beans and lettuce in hydroponic cu culture at Cornell. These are, um, on the left is a thin film nutri nutrient delivery system. On the right is a pool system with lettuce in it. Okay, neither of these are um, appropriate for microgravity, but both would be fine on a Mars colony. Here's hydroponic wheat growing in, at NASA. This is a special varietal that only grows about 18 inches tall. You can see that they grow it in racks here. You can grow it under high-pressure sodium lamps, which is the old way, or under a red and blue light-emitting diodes, which is much more efficient. Looks funny, though. Uh, on Mars, you might be able to take advantage of natural light by growing your plants in an inflatable greenhouse, either at uh, the pressure of the habitat for shirt sleeve access by the astronauts, or at a low pressure to save on construction costs. However, if the radiation load proves too much either for the plants or for the astronauts who will be looking after them, you can bury your greenhouse in regolith and use artificial lighting, probably LEDs, or possibly solar energy collected, uh, use, collected with lenses. You can see those blue things up above the hub of the uh, greenhouse unit. Um, yeah. And, and here's a, a, a slide from Bruce's site on uh, underground farming in Mars. Okay. Okay. So what would we grow? Well, these, the, the crops we grow break down into staple crops and salad and fresh crops. The staple crops are ones that would provide most of your calories, protein, and perhaps oil. You can see the soy and peanut there. The salad and fresh crops could be used right out of the, um, uh, the farm brought directly to the kitchen or directly to the table. The, the salads and fresh crops on the left are the original NASA shortlist. On the right, these are um, crops that have been added by consensus over the last uh, seven or eight years. They're all highly productive, um, all studied in uh, hydroponic culture, and, um, and all suitable, very suitable for growing um, in a colony. Now, how would we use them? We would mix the raw crops, for example, basil and garlic, with stabilized crops, crops that have been harvested and dried or preserved, like dried beans, and processed ingredients from uh, crops that have been grown, post-harvest post -harvest stabilized and processed, and then packaged ingredients from earth, like parmesan, salt and pepper, and so forth, to come up with a uh, prepared food. And this is just one example. In a 100% bioregenerative system, there won't be any meat, or there will be only very, very small quantities of animal products from perhaps closed system agriculture, or guinea pigs, goats, um, some of proposed insects. But uh, by and large, uh, it will be a, a plant-based diet, if not a totally vegan diet. And new ingredients may come to take an important part in the diet such as seitan, which is a wheat gluten um, um, formulation. It's kind of chewy and elastic, and it replaces meat very successfully in a lot of dishes. For sweeteners, there's not going to be sugar cane or sugar beets, so we would make syrup from, from, from grain, rice syrup, wheat syrup, and so forth. Tempeh and tofu from soybeans would become key protein sources in the diet and dairy would be replaced by soy and rice substitutes. These are not easy to do well. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over this um, because I think we're running out of time. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago, I was involved in um, a space food project to look at a bioregenerative diet for a lunar and Mars colony. We developed 200 recipes from ingredients that could be grown or processed on, on Mars or on the moon, we developed cost estimates for each one going from the cost estimate for production of the crop, cost of processing, yield losses, which are very important, and the labor cost of cooking. 
to come up with a cost per menu item, just as a caterer might do. And then uh, we taste tested each of these items and uh, used a linear optimization program to select the lowest cost crew diet that was consistent with various constraints on nutrition, palatability, and variety. So here's our cook cutting tofu. Here are our panelists enjoying their food. And uh, everyone asks, what were the best and worst things you picked? So I, I gave you a little list here. You can see that the um, favorite ones were mostly sweets and seitan dishes, the seitan being the uh, weak gluten material. And um, uh, ethnic foods, too, because ethnic foods, if, if, if you're not of the ethnicity that developed the food, you tend to be much more forgiving of, um, of, of, of faults. You, you tend to like it better than the people from the culture that developed it. So the pad thai that you like, someone from Thailand would say, this is terrible, but you could enjoy it very well. Okay. The, ten, the items that were least prepared were ones that were either uh, dairy replacers, uh, ones that were uh, considered by panelists to be um, unhappy combinations like the mustard carrots, okay, or things with pasty or uh, slimy um, textures, pasty like the tempeh or uh, slimy like our, um, our unfortunate attempt at whipped cream. Okay. But uh, we did get about 200 really good things for, for testing that met NASA's uh, cutoff of an average of six out of nine on the nine-point acceptability scale. Okay. So here's a typical one-day menu that we would serve our panelists. This would, this would be the sort of thing that you might find in a very large Mars colony with a bioregenerative diet uh, prepared by a skilled cooking staff. The reason I say this is that there are an awful lot of different foods here. If you were in a six-person crew the way we have out at MDRS, you might have one or two one-pot dishes at a meal. Okay. So we took our uh, 200 recipes, and we wanted to, to know, even though they're good enough to eat in a panel uh, where we invite our panelists for lunch twice a week and we have them eat these things and rate them, would they survive, would they thrive on a steady diet of these foods? So we recruited 16 subjects, and for 30 days, they ate nothing but our food. They came in for breakfast and lunch, and for dinner and weekends, we gave them coolers to take the material home. We gave them food, quality, mood, and health questionnaires every day. We monitored their, monitored their food intake. We weighed it in and out, and we monitored their body weight. Whenever they came in, we'd weigh them. And in fact, you can see how much they're smiling. This was the last day. They, <laughs> no, I don't mean it that way. <laughs> no. They were very happy on the diet. Uh, they, they initially lost a little weight because the diet was less calorie dense and lower in sodium than what they were used to. So that, that tends to, the low sodium tends to flush water out. Uh, the lower calorie density means that they're not used to eating so much volume to get their calories. But that corrected itself in a few days. Their weight crept back up. Nobody gained weight. Um, uh, and uh, they did miss their pizza, their ice cream, their fried chicken, but all in all, they were pretty happy. Now, NASA wasn't real happy with this study because we hadn't confined our panelists, but it costs in told amounts of money to isolate people for 30 days, take them away from their job, their family. It's really hard to do, so we did the best we can with free living subjects, and we were happy to see that uh, they adapted well to this diet and. Um, and their ratings of the acceptability of the food remained constant over 30 days. Okay. So what about uh, a bioregenerative food system? One thing we did find was that the labor and the yield losses would make it quite expensive compared to the prepackaged food. So let's look at uh, maybe we could do something with these packaged food systems that wouldn't be quite the same an enhanced packaged food system. Okay. And that would be achieved by bringing bulk ingredients, packaged wheat or flour or pasta, packaged rice, packaged dry beans, freeze-dried meats and vegetables, and have the crew cook their own and develop their own recipes and develop their own space cuisine. Okay. 
There are a lot of advantages and disadvantages on each side. Uh, for crew cooked food, there is preliminary evidence from the FMARS 2007 trial that crew cooked food um, delays the onset of menu fatigue. Uh, the crew at uh, FMARS 2007 was isolated and confined for four months. They, um, they cooked almost all of their own food. They had prepackaged food available, but they didn't like it. Um, and even though their food wasn't very good quality ingredients, they made good food that they all liked. Okay. On the other hand, it requires skill to cook this food. It requires planning for each meal uh, and planning over the life of the mission so you don't run out of the good stuff fast. And uh, there's increased use of water and um, uh, cleaning supplies, and there's an increased need for odor control in a closed habitat. For pre-prepared food, it's fast, requires no planning, instant choice, instant gratification, but the variety is going to run short on you after a while. And while it easily accommodates instant choice and uh, crew's dietary preferences as expressed on the ground during pre-testing, it has limited adaptive flexibility during the mission. If somebody goes up there and they develop a peanut allergy or a sensitivity to wheat, there's not a whole lot you can do. Okay. But with a crew cooked food system, you have much more a latitude for change. Okay. So we try this out at the Mars Desert Research Station over the past couple of years, uh, along with Kim Binstead, my collaborator at University of Hawaii. Now, is Mars, is MDRS like Mars? Well, yes and no. Um, it's Spartan, the quarters are confined, the state rooms are just about big enough to stand up and turn around in and lay down for, uh, for, for sleep. It's bigger than the submarine, Ed, but uh, not, much bigger than, uh, not much bigger than that. There are limitations on water, on electrical power, and on internet. It's isolated, um, it's in a barren environment. What people go out there to do is be simulated astronauts work on research and technology testing in, um, in a Martian-like testing situation with significant burden of reportage and maintenance just like real astronauts will have. Okay. So we gave the, the Marsonauts um, two different kinds of food. We gave them prepared foods, such as the backpacking foods that you've seen, um, dehydrated soups, canned goods, MRE shelf-stable bread, tortillas, uh, peanut butter, jelly, dried fruit, breakfast cereal and instant oatmeal. We gave them also cooking supplies, uh, freeze-dried, um, canned baking supplies, all sorts of different stuff, including a sprouting kit, which they pretty much ignored, um, and uh, everything that they would need to make bread, to, uh, to make baked goods, to cook their own meals. Uh, in addition, we gave them snacks, condiments, beverages, so that they could round out those, um, those supplies to make familiar meals and, uh, and have snacks when they needed them. The kitchen facilities are actually pretty good for a isolated and confined environment, including a microwave and a bread maker, coffee maker, um, refrigerator, freezer, uh, stove, and an oven. So they have all they need to cook like they cook at home. So what we did was we asked them to alternate days on pre-prepared instant food versus uh, days on uh, crew cooked food. So the first day was all pre-prepared. The second day was crew cooked. And uh, the difference was, uh, well, the similarities were that the crew eats the main, the main meal together on every day and breakfast, lunch, beverages, and snacks are consumed ad lib. Um, according to the way things are usually done at MDRS. On cooking days, they were forbidden from using the prepackaged entrees. But on prepackaged days, they had to use the prepackaged entrees. They could not do any cooking. They could not season the foods that they made except by the individual diner at the table. This is the way the astronauts would do it. They could not mix foods together um, a la Sandra Magnus, except by diners on their own plates at the tables, except for sandwiches. And this is, again, the way things work up in space. And here are some of the uh, things that they ate. On the top left is canned chili, instant mashed potatoes, and freeze-dried broccoli with hollandaise sauce. Okay. 
If they didn't put the hollandaise sauce in it, this meal would have been compatible with either kind of day. But uh, since they put on the hollandaise, it's a cooking day. Okay. okay, on the top right is a Martian BLT with, two, with um, rehydrated tomato power, powder, shelf-stable bacon, uh, alfalfa sprouts, and mayonnaise on a tortilla. Okay. Um, on the bottom left are um, cinnamon rolls ready to go into the oven on a cooking day. And on the right were some whole wheat loaves that were made in the bread maker and then um, um, slashed and put into the oven to make a flat loaf instead of a high loaf. Okay. So th these are examples of, uh, of the crew cooked food. Now these are examples of the prepackaged food up on the top left. This is supposed to be spaghetti marinara with mushrooms. Okay. On the bottom left is um, mushroom pilaf with uh, soy peas, and on the right is one of the Marzanots making uh, a dried soup. The dried soups were, were very well liked. The prepackaged entrees ra ra ranged from total raves to total pans. Okay. We collected a lot of data from our crew. I think I might be running out of time. Who can give me an estimate? How am I doing? Court, great. Okay, right. We took a lot of data from the crews. Um, uh, which increased their reported burden. It actually damaged compliance with the study a great deal because these, uh, many of the crews were not really sold on the study and they were busy already. But we got some good data from a number of crews, enough to make um, um, an analysis both of acceptability, of food intake reports, and of crew comments about the food and about their lives. So from 2009-2010, uh, we got about 75% usable data. From 2010-2011, we got about 50% usable data. Uh, if you come to MDRS uh, this coming season, and applications are out there on the web, um, be, be aware that uh, we'll ask you to be in the food study again. Okay. So the first thing we looked at was food acceptability. And I've got two years' data here. At the top is um, 2010. The red uh, is the pre-prepared food, the green is the crew cooked food, and the acceptability ranks from one is dislike extremely. For example, if someone, if, if someone held a gun to my head, I might consider putting it in my mouth. Okay? All the way to nine, like extremely, which means more please. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the, the histogram, the, the, the number of responses are much higher on the low side for the pre-prepared foods and much higher on the high side for the crew cooked foods. Now, during the second season, we went through and we analyzed the acceptability of all the pre-prepared foods. We took out all the duds and we put in more of the good stuff and we, we brought in new stuff that we thought they would like. And so you can see that the second year, the, the lower data set, that the difference is not quite as, uh, as distinct but it, there's definitely still an advantage to the crew cooked food. Crews just seem to like it better. Okay. We also looked at food intake. We asked the crews to, the crew members to say, on a scale of one to five where three is my usual intake, how much did you eat at the main meal where we had either the pre-prepared or the cooked food? Uh, those who ate less would rate it one, much less than usual, or two, somewhat less than usual. And if they ate more than their usual, they would rate it four or five. So you can see that the histograms um, show an advantage in intake uh, to the, um, to the pre-prepared, uh, to the cooked food, the green bars, there are more fours and fives than there are uh, for the green bars and more ones and twos for the, um, for the red bars. And we also asked them to, int to estimate their whole day intake. And here the advantage to the cooked food is still uh, there, and it's still significant, but it's much less. Okay. Uh, those results were replicated in the second year, um, although, the, um, although the difference is not as striking. The difference in intake is still significantly higher for cooked food. We analyzed mood and health responses, and we found no differences. So it's not that the pre-prepared or the cooked food was making anybody sick 
or depressed, uh, we just couldn't get significance on those. We also looked at the role of food in the overall life of the crew by looking at their comments. Every day, we had, a, we had a space every day on the questionnaire for the crew member to list what was a high point of your day at MBRS and what was a low point of your day. And we did a comment analysis to try to figure out how often food would be picked as a high or a low point of the day and whether that, diff whether that frequency would vary depending on whether it was a cooked food day or a pre-prepared food day. So we sorted our comment data into 20 different categories uh, of which food preparation and food quality, number four and five in the first column, were our food-related ones, and then there was everything else. Um, important ones tended to be EVAs and work issues. Okay. Um, in 2010, we found that uh, food quality and food preparation accounted for about 20% of the day's high points um, on cooking days, but only 2% of the day's high points on pre-prepared food days. So uh, it was great to see that, um, that food was considered important. Um, kind of disappointing to see that uh, the prepared food was, um, w was not as well liked there. Um, and if we look at the low point comments, um, food quality and food preparation were less than 1% of the low points on cooking days, but greater than 7% of the low points on prepared days. So overall, food was about, food accounted for about 15% of the high and low point comments altogether. And you can see that EVA towards the left and work issues at the far right uh, accounted for most of the high points. Habitat issues, that is power failures, toilet failures, um, um, uh, uh, heating failures, accounted for most of the, the low points. Okay. In 2011, uh, we had similar results, even with better uh, pre-prepared food, uh, we got an advantage to the cooked food on the high point of the day. Um, again, we, we found that the food accounted for maybe 15% maybe of the total high and low point comments. So that's a rough estimate of how, it, how important it is relative to all the other things that would, be, would make a day memorable. Okay. Now, we also tracked food preparation and cleanup labor. I won't go through the slide. You can ask me for it later if you want. But uh, we found that pre-prepared foods were much less, uh, they were somewhat less labor intensive and time consuming to prepare. Uh, we found that the difference was significant only in the second year. But all these times are much greater than the preparation times for NASA foods on orbit. So we have a long way to go, uh, either through economies of scale or through additional cooking skill to get these uh, labor times down to a, a degree that NASA would deem reasonable. So we, less, we learned uh, a lot of lessons that uh, they liked crew cooked food better, but the degree to which they liked it better depended on the quality of the pre-prepared foods, uh, and also depended on the degree to which we were able to um, restrict high grading and accommodate dietary restrictions. Now, high grading is going to be a problem on a long-term Mars mission. This is the tendency of early crews or crews in the early stages to use up all the good stuff and to leave the later crews or the crews at later stages with the crappy stuff. And the, the shining or, or maybe a sinking example of this was one individual in an early crew in 2010 who ate up half the season's worth of canned salmon due to a personal food preference for a high-protein diet. Okay. Um, we didn't know this happened until we got the, um, um, the, the questionnaires back, but we, we were getting complaints from crews all along. We have this great salmon patties recipe, but where's the canned salmon? Well, somebody had eaten it all up. You know? So in 2011, we prevented that by sorting all the food for all the crews into separate bins, and that seemed to work much better. Okay. Now, the last thing I'd like to talk about is a big barrier uh, to implementing what we find in terrestrial studies on orbit or in transit missions, and that is the astronaut's perennial refrain that foods taste different in space. Um, 
what they like on the ground they don't like in space, what they don't care for in the ground might be a favorite in space. And there are not, an awful lot of theories about why this should be so. Um, the, the leading theory right now is nasal congestion because upon arrival in microgravity, fluids shift from the lower body to the upper body. Uh, the astronauts experience um, the feeling of nasal congestion, nasal blockage. They experience headaches due to um, too much fluid in, in the head. And as we all know, when we have a cold and we're congested, we can't taste our food as well. So is it a question of the odorants in the food being able to make it up to the nasal receptors during eating? Okay. Um, it could also be, though, that there is some direct effect of microgravity on the senses. There's preliminary data f uh, been published that shows that uh, certain sensory processes are not as acute when one is flat on their back as when that person is uh, upright. It could be that in microgravity, the odor transport to the nostrils is, um, is affected, uh, the odor transport by free convection is affected by the air handling system and the absence of free convection. Uh, when you get a cup of coffee here on Earth, the aromas rise to your nose and you have that wonderful coffee aroma before you, you take your first sip. In microgravity, that can't happen. The, the coffee's in a bag. Okay? Even your lasagna, uh, those odors won't rise from the lasagna. You've got to put your nose right on the food to have a sniff of it. Could it be unfamiliar eating conditions? Uh, or uh, that is, when, when you're coping with unfamiliar conditions, do you have the time and the attention to, to be mindful of your food and enjoy it as it was supposed to be enjoyed? Is it menu fatigue? Um, are they getting tired of the food and just not paying attention to it, not liking it? Uh, is it a question of divided attention or hurried meals? Uh, are they experiencing aversions launched with space sickness in the first few days? Or is it a question of sensory deprivation uh, making, them, making them hungry for more intense sensations. Nobody really knows. But we're starting some new work in a few weeks down at uh, NASA's Bed Rest Center. Uh, over, f over two and a half years, we're going to have 16 subjects uh, in orthostatic bed rest. This is the sort of bed rest where their head is tilted down six degrees, simulating microgravity. Uh, 16 subjects, eight with exercise, eight without. Uh, and we're going to measure the nasal patency, the openness of the nasal passages by measuring the, um, the airway resistance in the upper airway and also by using a sonar technique called acoustic rhinometry where you send a little sonar signal right up the nose and it reflects off the nasal passages and gives you some dimensions of the nasal airway. So we'll be looking at this in bed-rested subjects before bed rest, early bed rest, mid, late bed rest, and the recovery phase to see if the nasal passage dimensions really do change. We're also going to measure the smelling acuity by having them smell different things and identify what they smell. This is easier and faster than threshold tests. And it can be done retronasally by presenting odors inside the mouth, by having them sip the odor through a straw, inhale the odor through a straw, and then breathe it out um, and access the uh, olfactory receptors through, the, uh, through the, what they call the internal nares, the passages from the throat through the nose, out through the, uh, out through the nostrils. We'll be tracking their appetite and their feelings of hunger and fullness through 100 days um, pre, in, and post bed rest. We're going to track the acceptability of odors and foods in their diet uh, and odors outside of their diet. And as a control, we're going to have a six-person crew in a Mars analog habitat on Mauna Loa for, for 120 days, serving as um, isolated, confined, but upright living controls of the bed-rested subjects. Yeah. Are you saying I'm out of time? Okay, this is it. Um, so food's an essential part of life support. Uh, we've talked about three basic choices prepackaged, bioregenerative, and uh, bulk ingredient based, each have their pros and cons um, and their specific challenges. There's plenty of work still to do in 
uh, understanding how astronauts can best be fed uh, in two ways, economically and also uh, in a way that they will like, a psychological, supportive way to feed them. There's plenty of work still to do. So I have a lot of people to thank um, at MDRS and NASA, my students who worked up the data, and also the people from the original space food study who've now moved on. Um, uh, and uh, I would like to offer you a cookie, but these, are, these were consumed out at MDRS. They're no-bake chocolate oatmeal cookies. But I will take questions on anything but recipes. I understand there may be time for just one question or two. I'll go, I'll go fast. Uh, you made the comment about NASA's timeline for eating that you sometimes broke the restrictions. So I was curious whether NASA still really considers eating as fueling versus the dining experience. And the second part of the question is, especially for long duration missions, where it appears like prepara preparation of food was preferred as to prepackaged, has anybody ever considered culinary training for the astronauts, just like technical training and everything, because you get a lot of benefit out of that. Now, to answer your first question, um, uh, let's see, which was NASA's timeline for eating. Oh, right. It depends on who you ask. If you ask the, the schedule mavens who tr are trying to fit in all the work in a small amount of time, for them, food is refueling. But for the astronauts, uh, for the... Um, the, the food lab down at NASA for the nutritionists and the food product developers, they're quite aware of the psychological uh, role of food. And uh, so these two aspects are intention. Okay. As for culinary training, uh, we've considered that and we've proposed it, but until astronauts cook for themselves as part of a regular mission, there certainly won't be any training. Uh, do you do uh, full blood panel tests both before and after to see if there are any effects, you know, over a uh, period, say that 30 day period uh, uh, on the subjects? Okay, we don't do those tests, but um, bed rest studies are ongoing, have been ongoing at NASA for many years, and we will have access to their data. Uh, the bed rest diet is a fixed diet. Um, they, do, they, they do their own work uh, along those lines, um, and it, it gets very complicated, actually. But the short answer is, yes, if we need that data, we'll have access to it. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>